Amen. Amen. What an encouraging message that he loves us still. So good to be back. I'm glad to see you all. We were planning to vacation and uh, we ended up more on a staycation. But I praise the Lord for His grace and His uh, healing and uh, regeneration. I'm always fascinated by human knowledge. Human knowledge, not only what we can know, but also how we know. If I want to know an object, I can take that object, I can take it apart into pieces. I can even take those pieces to a lab, look at the chemistry. There's a fascinating world in this object. But then if I want to get to know a flower, a plant, that flower is more than an object. Because there is life in that flower, and uh, life is not easy to get to know. If I look at a flower so I can know it, that flower will not put up resistance. But if I look at an animal, and I was thinking of uh, bringing... Uh, an animal on stage here, but I thought, what if the animal decides to leave? Because knowing an animal is different, many of them can put up resistance or at least say bye-bye and run away. Then getting to know a human being, that's even more complex because a human being can hide, a human being can lie, even to a lie detector. But there is so much fascination about knowing a human being because it's not only anatomy, it's also physiology and uh, also psychology. Getting to know a human being is quite a task. I would like to know, for instance, what happens with a human being that is able to shield a two-year-old with his own body, which happened last week at that parade, where a father with his body saved the life of his two-year-old. I would like to know how that is even possible, and I would like to also know what happens in the mind of a criminal. But more than the fascination of knowing humans, what I'm attracted to is knowing God. Can you even know God? Can you know someone of that complexity? Can you know the unknowable? Or, is there any chance for me to know God unless He reveals Himself? But how much of that revelation do I need for me to be able to really know Him? And I'm sure there are people here this morning that in their minds ask, Okay, I would like to know God and at least understand why he didn't stop the bullet. Couldn't he? And if he could, then why didn't he? 
And those are difficult questions. Those are inquiries that may take a lifetime of research and study. Nevertheless, if I look at the Bible, I see in the Bible the possibility for us, for you and for me, to know the unknowable. And I would like to invite you to look at uh, Ephesians chapter 3, starting with verse 14. Ephesians chapter 3, starting with verse 14. And I would like to ask you to please look at the dynamics of uh, God manifested in the interaction of the Father, Jesus Christ the Savior, and the Holy Spirit. This is what it says. Chapter 3, starting with verse 14. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what Paul the Apostle says is this. For this reason, there is some reason for that. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that He would grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with might through His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in you, in your hearts, through faith. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Let us pray. Lord, we bow our knees with the Apostle Paul. And we pray that what he's praying for those people then in Ephesus, you will also fulfill in our lives. In Jesus' name. Through the Holy Spirit. Amen. For this reason, the Apostle says, and you may ask, for what reason? Because now we are in the middle of the book, chapter 3, the final part of the chapter, and uh, when you look at the sentence, for this reason, you may remember that he said that before, right at the beginning of the chapter. And uh, he never really told us for what reason. Because it seems that everything that he has said up to this point, from the beginning of the book up to this point, everything is part of that for this reason. And he has several things there that uh, we, I think, could see as the reason for which Paul the Apostle wants to kneel down, to bow his, knee, his knees. First, the concept of predestination that we saw in the first chapter. The predestination in Jesus Christ, which is actually the plan of salvation, that God, from before sin even appeared, already had a plan of salvation then we are saved by grace through faithfulness. That is a wonderful news because we realize we cannot save ourselves. It is God that saves us. By grace we are saved through faithfulness. Actually, His faithfulness that gives birth to our faithfulness. And then He also says... That we are created now in Him, in Jesus Christ, to walk in the good works that God has prepared for us. And then he goes on saying that there is no wall of separation now between Jews and Gentiles because we are all built together. And then 
Last time we saw that he spoke about the mystery of God. The mystery of God of which he is a minister by grace. And now he is in prison and still he believes that this is a gift of God's grace to him. That he can be a minister of the mystery of God. And what is the mystery of God? Well, he says that mystery that is revealed now in a special way, unlike it was known before, is that we are all joint heirs, joint body, joint partakers. Somebody told me last time, Pastor, watch out how many times you use the word joint on stage because that means something else. I hear you, brother. The point is... We are together. We are fellows. We inherit together. We are Christ's body together. We are partakers of His glory together. And after seeing what that uh, reason is, let's now go on and uh, see how Paul explains to us why he is now kneeling. What is he praying for? What is he asking from God? For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father, he says, of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family or every family in heaven and earth is named. And I would like to point something out here. I have two words there in blue. One is pater, or pater, which is the father. And then patria, which is family. That's the translation. You probably know that uh, there are languages in, you have, in which you have, modern languages, I mean, in which you have the word patria from the Greek. For instance, the Spanish has patria, or the French has patri. Why? Because, because this concept of uh, fatherland, that's how we use it in English, comes from the father. So there's a father, and there is things that come from the father, that spring from the father. And the, the concept that Paul speaks about here is that he bows his knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the pater from whom the whole family, which is patria, comes. And this is family in a larger sense than we probably think right now because of the limitation of language. Because what he says, that there is a whole family in heaven and earth. And the other possibility of translating that sentence is from whom, the, from whom every family in heaven and earth is named. The Apostle Paul speaks about families on earth and families in heaven. Which I think is a very interesting concept because uh, we know about our social kind of organizing life on this earth. But that gives, gives us a sense of the fact that in the heavenly realms there is some sort of organizing as well. And uh, families in heaven and earth all come from the Father. And it goes on, verse 16, that he would grant us. This is the first aspect the Apostle Paul is praying for. That God would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Instead of losing heart, which he mentions in chapter 3, verse 13, he says, No, I don't want you to lose heart because I'm in prison, because I have a hard time here. No, no. I want you to be strengthened with might through the Holy Spirit in the inner man. 
And this is something we've seen before in the book of Ephesians. Because in chapter 1, the Apostle Paul, in another prayer he prays, he mentions the concept of a power, of a special kind of power. And if you remember, I pointed out at that time that there are four words in the Greek, dynamis, energeia, kratos, and iskus. And all four mean the same thing, power. And he says something to the effect of, I pray that you will know the power of the power of the power of His power, which is actually the power of resurrection. So what Paul is saying here, that he is praying that we will be strengthened with might through the Spirit in the inner man. Because for Jesus Christ to live in us, we go through a resurrection first. But then we keep receiving power. We are in a constant need of power. And verse 17 lets us know that we need that power from God, the power through the Holy Spirit, the power of resurrection on a constant basis, so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faithfulness. And the word there for dwelling is to house permanently. It's not something that he will take at one point and then he would leave and come back at different points. What Paul is praying for is that Christ will house in us, will dwell in us on a permanent basis. In our hearts, through faithfulness. Faithfulness, His faithfulness that creates in us or gives birth in us to our faithfulness. And then he goes on explaining in uh, verse 17, the second part. That you, being rooted and grounded in love. Rooted and grounded. A plant is rooted. A building is grounded. He brings two illustrations together to give us a sense of how firm, how strong we should be in love. Yes, we are being strengthened. And because God strengthens us, we are renewed. Our inner man is renewed. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 emphasizes this. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing. Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. As I see signs of perishing on my outside. And as you probably sometimes struggle with the same picture looking back at you in the mirror. The Apostle Paul is pretty honest, saying, yes, our outer man is perishing. Our inward man is being renewed day by day. And is there anything more beautiful than see somebody in a body that has already signs of perishing on it, but then see how the inner man shines through the body. And you can see a renewed man day by day being renewed. 
And the Apostle Paul continues his thought. Yes, for this to happen, we have to be rooted and grounded in love. Verse 18. May be able, so that we may be able to comprehend, to catch, to grasp, to take over, to lay hold of. That's the concept. The concept uh, of uh, the Greek. I had a ball here, Michael. Have you taken my ball? Who took my ball away? All right. So the point is, now we will play with an imaginary ball. Okay? The point is this. That we may be able to comprehend, to catch it. Imagine somebody that has a ball here, and you are standing over here. Do you see the ball? I wish I could see it. <laughs> the ball is thrown from here, and somebody is there to catch the ball. That's what Paul says. I pray that you may be able to comprehend, to catch it, to grasp it with all the saints. And, and please notice this. This message here is not about you at an individual level being able to grasp the love of Christ. That is important too. But that's not the topic here. Here the topic is that we are supposed to be able to catch, to comprehend... To get it with all the saints, meaning this is a congregational or a community kind of experience of knowing, of comprehending God's love. To comprehend what is the width and length and depth and height, all the dimensions of love. Verse 19 to know, he says, the love of Christ which passes. And the word there for Greek, in the Greek is to throw beyond. To know the love of Christ which passes. See? That's why I put this wooden piece here. The love of Christ is something that passes. It goes beyond knowledge. This is the limit of knowledge. And, and this is the picture that the Apostle Paul creates. We, in Jesus Christ, together with all the saints, we are supposed to be able to catch something that is not within the realm of normal catching. It's something that passes beyond understanding. This is the limit of understanding. Well, what you can grasp, you can catch, goes beyond. And he uses that concept several times in uh, Ephesians. For instance, in chapter 1, verse 19. He says, And I pray that you will know what is the exceeding or surpassing greatness of his power. So he first speaks about God's power that is exceeding. And the same word is used there in the Greek, hyperbolon. You can get the hyperball in English from there. Meaning that somebody has a ball. You, you still can see the ball, right? Somebody has a ball here, throws the ball. Normally, the limits of greatness is here. This is where greatness ends. But he says, no, no, no. The greatness of his power goes beyond so imagine yourself somebody is there throwing something to you and uh, you are here you want to catch it and you realize when the ball comes that the ball will go beyond you and will fall somewhere in a realm that you are not in yet so what would you do to catch the ball you would run here 
and try to catch it. Same concept when he speaks about grace in chapter 2, verse 7. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding, again, hyperbolon, riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So the picture is this. There is grace. There is richness of grace. And in our mind, there is a limit to that. This is the limit of the richness of grace. And he says, no, no, no. It's a hyperbolon. It's exceeding. So you have somebody that throws the ball of grace, and you, you're here waiting for the ball to fall and, and to catch it, but you, you realize, no, no, this is going to pass me. So what are you going to do? You're going to run over here to catch it. Because that's the concept of divine power. That's the concept of divine grace. You, if, if you are to catch it, you have to be prepared that it's going to be exceeding. It's going to be overpassing, surpassing. And you have to move into a realm where you can get, get it. You can catch it. Same with love. In uh, chapter 3, verse uh, 19, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. How, how can you know the love of Christ that passes knowledge? If knowledge is limited, this is the limit of knowledge. And somebody throws the ball of knowledge of love to you. Love, the ball of love is coming, is coming. You want to catch it. But you realize it's going to pass. This is too big, too much, too great for me. So how can you catch that ball if you are not going to move to the realm where that exceeding or passing, surpassing love can be grasped. So in other words, the Apostle Paul speaks about the possibility to grasp, to catch something together as a community, together as a congregation, as Christ's church, as a body, something that is not available to common people in this world. Because most people in this world live in the realm that is before or up to the point where knowledge finishes and we are limited. But you in Jesus Christ, he says, you can get beyond that and grasp something that normally is not available to people. What is that? How is the love of God of a surpassing or a throw beyond nature? Well, just think about this basic teaching of the Bible that we all know from John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Everybody can appreciate this giving part. God loves so much so that he gives. But if you read the next section that whoever or whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There you are not talking about loving everybody in general. You are also talking about loving each individual in particular. It's not only every, but it's also each. Let's just do this exercise together. One morning, because you have to drive to your place of work, you get on the interstate, and uh, you start thinking, and you look around, and uh, you realize you are in a river of cars. Everybody is going somewhere. And a warm feeling comes upon you and say, oh Lord, this is so great. Wonderful. You love everybody. 
you love those that go in this direction, you love those that go in that direction, and you, you reach an intersection, a, a big one, and you look around and say, oh Lord, you love everybody here. But then on one of the cars, right in front of you, you spot a sticker that triggers some reactions, some emotional reactions within you, and you say, wow, do you love that guy as well? Because that guy, on a political level, on a mentality, worldview level, does not embrace what I would embrace. Or think about the fact that three cars from you, there may be a criminal sitting in that car. And God loves even that criminal. When I say God loves, I'm not saying that God agrees with the criminal. But saving love is of a nature that even if one human being existed, Christ would still die for that one. Now, that is not in the realm of this. That is a realm past the limit of knowledge. When you start interiorizing what that means, it will start bothering you, indeed upsetting you, driving you crazy. Because you may realize there is somebody at your workplace that you can't stand. And God loves that person. There may be somebody in your very family because, hey, let's assume it. Some of the weirdos are in our families. When we go home, because we know them the best. And yes, God loves them as well. And uh, you come to church. And we are so many different kind of people here. And yes, God loves everybody. It's so easy to say, oh, I love everybody. Yeah, okay. Do you love each? <laughs> Don't we need to pass this limit of knowledge to get it? To catch it? Because that's the, that's the illustration. There is something that throws beyond and then somebody that is supposed to catch it. You, you cannot catch it here. You have to pass over here to catch it. Let me give another illustration. This is something I, I took from Ty Gibson. Ty Gibson, I don't know if you know him, is a pretty well-known speaker and pastor here in the United States. And I would like to quote from a Bible study set he and David Ashrick prepared. It's called Truth Link. Lesson number two is uh, where I'm reading from. Please just follow the reading and uh, then I will show something. Love, by definition, he says, is self-giving and other-centeredness so in order for love to exist, there must be more than one person. There must be a relationship. If you lock yourself alone in a room and stay there for the rest of your life, you will never experience love. For the simple reason, what is the reason? That a solitary self cannot experience love. Is that logical? All right, then... It's logically, it logically follows then that since God is love, God is more than one personal being while at the same time exists as one essential divine entity, as the three unity of God. And it says there is a pure self-evident genius in the fact that the Bible identifies God as three who are one. If God were an absolute singularity, a solitary self, like this, with no external coexisting others, it could not be said with any coherence that God is love. Do you agree on that? A unitary self cannot be called love. Now, it goes on saying, 
where there is only one person, love cannot occur. Where there are two, two, each is the sole recipient of the other's attention, giving potential for self-centeredness. Are you following? That's what happens when people get married and I just want you for myself. Okay? It's still self-centered. But the moment, oh, <laughs> that is crazy. But the moment there are there, there are three, one, two, three, each recipient must also humbly defer attention to the third party, and each one must occupy the position of the third person to the other two. Pure selflessness can now occur. Did you get it? Uh, it's still hard for me to get it because I, I still feel sometimes that I'm, I'm in this realm, you know? Now you, can, can somebody throw this ball to me? Come on, come on, come on, George. So, so that's the point. If, if that's love, okay, and I'm, I'm here, and he throws that ball in a way that it will fall there, it will, pretty, it will be pretty hard for me to get it, to catch it. What do I need to do? I need to move here. Oh, man. I, I, I barely caught it, you know. Now, 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 now throw it so I can catch it. Ah, oh, I caught it. Thank you. I didn't catch it. All right, so, so, so that's the concept. That's the concept. It, it's coming back to me. All right. So it's, it's beyond. But there's, there's one, one third aspect for which the Apostle Paul is praying. And he says in uh, verse 19, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, really? How big should I have it, my heart or my whole being, so I will take in the fullness of God? To be filled with the fullness of God. In Colossians chapter 2 verse 9, the Apostle Paul says that in him, in Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead which is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bodily. And that is supposed to be dwelling in me on a personal basis through Jesus Christ. And uh, you remember John chapter 1, verse 14, where it says that the Word that became flesh, that we could see, beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the fullness of God, which is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is also grace plus truth. Because in Jesus Christ, that was the combination of two divine elements, grace and truth, that was His fullness. I would like to show you a syllogism. Do you know what a syllogism is? It's a, it's a logic sentence after sentence, and then you get the result of it. So if we start with the sentence, God is love, please follow carefully. And then we say yes, and God's fullness is in Christ. And then Christ is full of grace and truth. Then can't we say that love is grace and truth? Of course we can. Because God is love. So practically, the manifestation of love in a sinful human context is those two elements, grace and truth. And you may think, well, if, if that's the case, if, if all these things are to happen with, with us as a body, because with all the saints, 
That's the point of it. So these, these things, this way of knowing God's love, this way of Christ dwelling in us, and this way of having the fullness of God in us, humanly speaking, that's impossible. And that's why Paul says, as he goes on, yeah, I know, verse uh, 20, uh, now to him who is able, because he is able, to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. And what power is that? It's the power of resurrection. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. And usually, because we heard amen, we would stop here. And we would say, Whew, we got it. I don't know if anybody, when we read the Bible, when we see the amen, we have the tendency of continuing one more chapter. But look how it continues. I, therefore, therefore what? Well, therefore, based on what I, I've been telling you and praying for. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, or in the Lord, which is Paul being a prisoner of the Lord and being in a prison in Rome, beseech or, 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 or ask you, plead with you. Parakalo, that's the word there in the Greek. And to this day, if you go to Greece and you want to ask for something, you will say, parakalo. I plead, I, I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Meaning that your calling, your walking is different from the walking and from the calling of the people that are in the realm of knowledge over here. We have to pass over here and, and our walk has to be worthy of the calling which you were called, with which you were called, which is to be in Jesus Christ. Verse 2, look, look how, how that is manifested. With all lowliness, or lowliness of mind, humility. If you remember when Pastor Rudy preached about Ani, that's, that's the concept. Poor in the spirit. Blessed are those that are poor in the spirit. And gentleness which is meekness or mildness. I invented two words that do not exist in English, aggressivelessness and savagelessness. That's the point. It's like a horse, a savage, a wild horse that was domesticated, that was tamed. It's lowliness and gentleness. And those two words appear in Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, when Jesus says, Matthew 11, 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me what for i am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls gentle and lowly in heart that's the same kind of call of walk that we've been called to and then it goes on same verse 2 with long suffering or longanimity forbearance bearing with one another in love or tolerating that's a more modern way of saying it tolerating one another in love love which is grace and truth but this is what I see happening and I've seen this in my life I've seen this as I analyze life around me and in the history of our denomination in the history of Christianity the Apostle Paul is going to something here. Look at verse 3. Endeavoring or being diligent, making effort. The Greek says using speed to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace or in the bond of shalom. What does that mean? Keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. This is what I've seen. Because I've always asked myself, how is it that the unity that Jesus was praying for in John chapter 17, Father, I want them to be one. How can that be manifested in practical terms 
in a church, in his church. And this is how it came. I put there a list of what happens quite often when we have the impression that those qualities that the Apostle Paul lists, lowliness, gentleness, long-suffering, bearing one another, hmm, they are not sufficient for our walk to be called worthy of the calling we have received. Why? Because those qualities, lowliness, gentleness, long-suffering, bearing one another or bearing with one another, those lean heavily on the grace side. Don't they? I mean, those, those are all manifestations of mercy or grace. Merciful attitude, graceful attitude. Lowliness, gentleness, long-suffering, bearing one another. But love is not grace alone. Love is grace and truth. That's the fullness of divine love in Jesus Christ. And it should be in us as well. So this is how we solve the issue quite often. We say, well, yes, lowliness is great for the sight of grace. But for the sake of truth, we have to add in a little loftiness as well, because we have the truth. Or, gentleness, yes, that's good enough on the side of uh, grace, but a little aggressiveness has to be brought in to defend the truth. Or, long-suffering, yes, that's great on the side of grace, but a little short-temperedness is still allowed because the truth. Or bearing with one another, yes, that's grace on the side of that's great on the side of grace, but on the side of truth, mm -mm, I can tolerate this. See what the struggle can be, and I feel this, and I, I believe you feel that as well. When when we do lowliness, gentleness, long suffering bearing one another, we have a fear in us that we may make a mistake. And you may know uh, Ellen White's quote. I will uh, have it up there. It's from a letter that he wrote to George Butler in 1887. And the discussion was about somebody that did something wrong. And he was, he was treated badly. And she said, I wish that we had much more of the spirit of Christ and a great deal less self and less of human opinions. If we err, let it be on the side of mercy rather than on the side of condemnation and harsh dealing. Or if we are to err, rather on the side of grace than on the side of truth. I would like to just read verses 4, 5, and 6. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And we are called to know that one. And the knowledge of that one is not here in the realm of knowledge, is in the realm of past normal human knowledge. There was a TED talk that became famous. It was uh, given in 2006 by Sir Ken Robinson. Sir Ken Robinson was one of the greatest figures in the realm of uh, education. He impacted the realm of education, especially in the area of creativity. The title of that TED talk, you can check it out, was Do Schools Kill Creativity? I don't know if you had a chance to watch that. It's a famous, it's the most watched 
the, the TED Talk that has the most views in the history of TED Talk. At least it was in 2020 when he passed away. He passed away of cancer, so it wasn't COVID. But that, that time, he already had 66 million views on the official web page of the TED Talk and some 20 more, 20 million more, so 80 plus millions of views. I don't know how many that video has today, but here is the point he was using to drive his message home. He was talking about a six-year-old little girl in a school setting, a little girl that has a hard time focusing on anything. But when they have a drawing class, she's all alert and all focusing. And uh, the teacher is fascinated. She says, wow, this is amazing. That's, there must be something special about this little girl. And she goes over to her, looks over her shoulder while the little girl is drawing something. And she asks her, hey, what are you drawing? And she says, well, I'm drawing a picture of God. Picture of God? Nobody knows what God is like. And she says, well, they will in a moment. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's the problem. That's the problem of our society. Nobody knows what the picture of God is like. Well, they will in a moment when you walk out. God is love. Is the picture that you carry from, from here, from this experience, because we are supposed, again, to see that, to experience that reality together with all the saints, and then we walk our ways. Will the picture that we take to society be perfect? No, it will not. But if there is any mistake in it, any error in it, on what side should that error be? Amen.